Hello, everyone, and welcome to REST, which stands for Resiliency and Empowerment Seminar today. It is a show where we speak with CEOs of small, mid-sized businesses, heads of nonprofits, and other community leaders. I am so delighted and honored to have Lee Weinrub with us today. A little bit about Lee. Lee is the CEO and founder of Mind in Motion, which is a company that really focuses on uh, connecting with nature and coaching. And uh, she'll tell us more, but a little bit more about her is that she has the mindset of a coach and she executes like an athlete that comes from her competitive tennis that she'll tell us more about as well. And um, it's really a deep commitment and value that she has to help others to reach their personal best. She has a master's in counseling psychology from Northwestern University and a background, as I mentioned, in playing competitive tennis. And she's developed this unique approach to help people access their potential for greatness by pioneering what she calls walk and talk therapy with the belief that there's more effective ways to help clients than just by going on a couch. And it's this unique methodology that became Mind in Motion. And she works with individuals and organizations delivering keynotes, interactive workshops, her walk and talk sessions, and a product line of carefully curated messages, some cool clothing and blankets with very inspiring messages. Check it out. And she's worked with organizations like Nike, NBC, UPS, Canyon Ranch, John Deere, and the like. So with this, welcome to the show, Lee. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. I'm so glad that you can be with us today. So Lee, why don't you take us back to the early days of your career and your competitive tennis playing days and how you sort of figured out and navigated your journey. I'm going to take you back to kind of little little Lee because I think that the story started started probably at about four years old when I used to love watching my parents play tennis uh, with oh. their friends and I remember my, my very first tennis lesson I can remember the feeling of balancing the ball on the strings and thinking that was a super cool experience and that began somewhat of an obsession of you know smacking yellow fuzzy <laughs> tennis balls and, and something about it was it was very innate. I really enjoyed the practice. Um, I was a very athletic kid, probably like a very sort of kinesthetically geared uh, little, little Lee. Um, and then I got more and more competitive. By, by the time I would say like eight or nine years old, uh, I was practicing a lot. Um, started playing uh, tennis tournaments, USTA tennis, tennis tournaments, and wow. like between 10 to 15, got very, very into it, had an amazing coach. It's a huge part of my identity, but I the better I got, probably yes. the more stress I would feel, um, ah. the more patience I would have, the, the more I desired a higher level of achievement and ranking, and thus began the beginning of my having some emotional frustration on a tennis court oh. so it, it was it was my own experience first as an athlete realizing like unless I learned how to calm myself down oh. and clear my mind and stop reacting like John McEnroe would I probably <laughs> wasn't going to win as many matches as I would like so be beginnings of studying psychology I, I would like read some articles and my coach would give me some some books to read like the inner game of tennis and my mother was a psychiatric nurse, so I oh. sort of had that in me, that sort of curiosity. I was that kid at the dinner table that would ask my parents, why, why, why? I want to know why, why, why? So curiosity mixed with, I, I had to practice my own emotional regulation. I wanted to study the human brain to help myself. And then I played college tennis at Northwestern, very competitive. Wow. Um, and I quickly realized that my dreams to play in Wimbledon and be a pro probably were not going to happen. 
which was a really tough time in my life, just sort of mm. um, accepting that. And I was so used to being so physical because every day it'd be like yes. three, five hours a day. So I went through this period of time where I was asking, it's like, what do you want to do? I had, I had parents who were probably pretty traditional in their thinking. And I contemplated, you know, do I, do I move to New York City? Do I go into the business world? Like kind of a question around what my values. And quite frankly, out of stalling the reality of being in the hardcore New York City working world, I decided to take a job coaching tennis at Dartmouth. Wow. Um, loved it. It was an incredible opportunity. And I was working with, you know, 10 different personalities, obviously very, very intellectual yes. people. <sighs> Um, and that, that furthered my interest in understanding human motivation. Why could one, one kid execute under pressure, but another kid couldn't? Um, why could one kid control some of their reactions and another kid couldn't? I ended up coaching for several years at Northwestern after that as well. And confirmed even more that what I was most interested in was studying the psyche. And I decided to go to grad school at Northwestern they had an amazing program. They're very well known for uh, the Marriage and Family Institute there. So they had two tracks. One was individual counseling, more right. Freudian, Jungian psychoanalytic theory, and one was more marital and family therapy. And I went for the, I wanted to understand dreams and I wanted to understand the unconscious and I was gonna read about Freud um, and every theorist at the time. And it was an amazing education, but, quickly realized after I got out of grad school that I needed to help people in a more active way. Um, that I was finding myself in an office with people, had a beautiful office, spent a lot of money to make sure I had these beautiful couches and these beautiful chairs, <laughs> very designed, very slick. But what I saw in all my clients was, I, I almost could see that they had physical angst. It was, it was uncomfortable. Ah. Took a while to, to sort of groove and flow. Um, and you could kind of see people wearing some of that, the, the emotional weight of their life and anxiety mm. and the darkness and the stuckness. Mm. And so um, I literally had one session. I was in, in Chicago at the time. It was very, very cold. And I look, looked at this woman who I'd been working with for a while. And I said, like, I can feel how much angst you have. I'm catching it because it's contagious. Grab your coat. Let's go for a walk. And I knew within 10 minutes of that session, this was my calling. This was what I was going to do. I was going to take clients out for walks in nature um, just so that they could get oxygen. Um, they felt like just, just lacing up their sneakers and putting one foot in front of the other. They were doing something to solve a problem and not just talking about it. And physiologically, every walk I've ever taken even, even talking about very difficult parts of life. The physiology was working in our favor because endorphins were cranking and chemistry was changing and di seeing different visuals I and mean, looking at Lake Michigan and looking at the skyline and feeling the wind. Um, it, it, it was giving people an opportunity to see things from different perspectives. It was remarkable and profound how quickly this natural walk and talk, simple idea, was really helping Yes. People. And so I want to dig further into the, the self-care piece that started with your personal journey. And thank you for sharing that. I find, particularly with a lot of women, that there comes a lot of guilt with um, self-care because of a lot of different roles that we tend to play. Can you share how... Um, how to make it okay, as I tried to give this message to people, but I'd love to hear your perspective on making self-care okay and, and why it is so important. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting topic. I, I think that when you, when you engage in a genuine conversation with someone and you really start to get to like, well, what are your values? Um, and they start listing off what they believe to be priorities in life. A lot of times people don't list health right off the bat, yeah. uh, but I, I definitely try to move the conversation toward like waking people up to, if you don't have your health, and that includes uh, mental, physical, uh, emotional health, you have nothing. There's nothing, there's nothing left of you to give to anybody. So you're kind of, you're going to be useless unless you, you put that as your number one priority. I personally put that as my number one priority. I don't always execute it. 
Um, there are a lot of times I don't always execute priorities and values, but I think the, the beginning of the conversation is a wake up call on it, it must be uh, your number one priority. Um, that being said, I, I think it's interesting, especially with women, a lot, of, a lot of our, probably our nature, but a lot of our survival from early on is you, you, you learn how to pick up on how to make other people feel a certain way because yes. a lot of your survival and a lot of your um, kind of winning affection and positive feedback in your life is to make sure that the people in your family are doing okay. You're kind of checking in with them and thus begins um, learning an amazing ability to ensure that the people around you are going to be okay. But when you put the emphasis on taking care of these other people, yes. you kind of shut off an access to even knowing how you're feeling. Yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting, and pe people kind of make jokes about how when you go to therapy and your therapist asks you, "Well, how do you feel?" Um, sometimes people are baffled because they're not even sure how they feel because they're so focused on make sh making sure other people in their life are are, are stable and okay and happy. Um, yes. And thus, they're not putting enough energy into even noticing how they feel. So I would say, number one is make people aware that the value of health is number one. Without it, you can't be of any service. Um, and, and number two, to kind of wake up to this realization that um, you, you can't spend your whole life trying to take care of everybody else's feelings. You have to make sure you, you start waking up to like, what are your feelings? And what are the things that you can do in a day, little things that make you feel empowered, that make you feel nurtured, that make you feel calm, that make you feel energized and impassioned, but that requires a real wake up call to even knowing what it is you're feeling. Um, so. so I wanna pick up on the point around empowerment. So tell me how you, advise people and, and to really step into their power. Um, what do you advise? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I, I, I feel like how I would start that conversation is one, and I, I, I oftentimes feel like I'm less of a, a coach or a therapist. I feel like a lot of times I'm a philosopher because I, I believe that, um, knowledge is power yes. and i believe that knowing oneself is the greatest kind of platform probably for empowerment in order to exercise the pieces of of life that you have control over you you really do have to know yourself know what your assets are know what your gifts are um and i would i would say that the sort of the beginning of recognizing how to sort of deploy your arsenal of strength is you have to know what tools are in the arsenal. And I, I absolutely make an assumption, and I think it's usually a correct one, that everyone has natural gifts. Um, I, I, I absolutely believe in, in, in the, the divine power of someone being their authentic self, really knowing what their true self is. And when they bring, yes. when they recognize what makes them them, that's the greatest form of empowerment we can have. Absolutely. I had a, a coach who used to say, you know, don't be stingy with your brownies. You were born to um, serve a purpose while you're here on this earth and don't be selfish with it and, and, and be awakened to that. I think in hearing you say that uh, reminds me of that that quote about you know it's not it's not that we fear that we're inadequate it's that we fear that we have greatness to us um, I think it's a Marianne Williamson quote um, you know Oprah's used yes. a lot um, but that it's that there's something in us that knows there there's a power there's a gift by the fact that we even exist and are alive there's something already. Um, in our birthright, that we are already evolved. We already have the gifts to exist right here, right now as us. Yes. And I think sometimes when people think about empowerment and their strengths, um, they jump to, it has to be like some big thing, some big special yes. extraordinary thing. I think it's actually something much more simple. Um, and we, we discredit our gifts, we minimize our gifts, um, but they don't necessarily have to be something grand or unique or different. 
but there's something in our essence that makes us uniquely us. And we have to believe that that in and of itself, while simple perhaps, is infinitely powerful and could be utilized every day to serve people in our life every day, which has widespread impact that we can't even measure. Yes. So why do you think that people discredit their gifts? Why do you think that's so? That's a great question. Um, I think you know, my, my instinct is to say, I think there's, there's a bit of um, vulnerability in laying mm. it out there. Um, sort of like if you really put yourself on the line and things don't work out, um, what's it going to be like for you to be yeah. bare your soul and, and being fully open and vulnerable. Um, and and in, in, until we recognize that the, bear, the bearing of our gifts, the, the opening up, the being fully ourselves, the exercising the Brene Brown kind of heart open, um, diving into and embracing the tidal wave pool of vulnerability, until we see that as strength and security, that we actually have strength and safety and security just by being us, we probably live with, with a terror that, oh my God, mm. God forbid I lay it out there, God forbid I, mm. I believe in myself and what if, what if I disappoint? What if I let somebody down? What if I'm not as good as I think? Um, that there's, there's a, a shame story in our head um, and we don't need to do this all the time perfectly to, to be qualified to have gifts, but I think it's absolutely a, a, a fear of embarrassment and shame and, and looking you know, too big for our bridges. But I think it could all be reduced to the fact that it is vulnerable to be fully you and to let it rip because you yes. don't know how you're gonna respond. Um, you're, at, you're not in control of how you're received. Right. So you just be in control of, of of how you bring the gift. You're only in control of your own part. Yes. And, and it is scary to be vulnerable, mm -hmm. but when we do let it go, so to speak, then I, I've seen people and, and you've seen it too, blossom, right? Just like, wow, it, there's like a different energy, right? That comes across when somebody like is able to truly be themselves amazing right. there's 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 nothing more magnificent i think there's nothing more powerful but it's rare and i i would say just this conversation's making me think if i had a dollar for every time i heard a, a client particularly women yeah. share that that they are they 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 worry about other people's judgments of them mm -hmm. that they're burdened by constant worry of other people's judgments mm -hmm. um, i would be a very very wealthy woman right now for for <laughs> For every dollar that I've collected. And the minute I start having conversations with people to say, yes, that is part of reality, having a concern over judgment, because it's part of your social survival to, to yes. have some concern. But the minute I start saying, let's talk about your judgment of yourself. Let's, let's talk about your values and what, what you believe in. And are, are you cool with how you're perceiving yourself? Do you feel like you're living up to your expectations of authentically being you? When people are, are um, assessing themselves honestly, yes. the judgment from other people begins to really quickly wane. It's still there, but it shrinks significantly. Sort of like find internal motivation, internal um, validation, and all of the externals, they just begin to get smaller and smaller and smaller. You don't listen to the outside yes. as much as listening to, the, to your own, which goes back to your whole empowerment. Um, I think that that's a huge source of empowerment is, are you, are you cool with you? And if you're not, what can you do to change? Right, and, and, and it, it took me a while to learn that, um, not to rely on the external validation. And I didn't even realize that I was doing that. Mm -hmm. So I'm so glad that we're shining a light on, on this. I wanna get to your, company and all that you do with Mind in Motion. So can you share with us how you took those inspirational words and, and put it into not only what you do with your therapy sessions and your talks, but also with 
your clothing and accessories line? Yeah. Um, so this years ago when I was primarily working with athletes, I had one athlete who had a lot of performance anxiety. She was a very good tennis player, but she'd get really nervous. And so she had a big match. And before the match, I took a, a, a Sharpie and I, I wrote the word breathe upside down on the bottom corner of her shirt. Uh, and I wrote it upside down and I told her, don't look over at me on, in the stands because I can't help you. You have to look within. And if all you remind yourself to do is breathe, you're going to be just fine. Let the results unfold. Just remember to look within and to breathe. Uh, and she ended up winning this big match. And I had a couple students say, oh, can you make me a shirt? So I just, for fun, was writing powerful kind of verbs, like action words on shirts. And I probably made 20, 30 shirts. People thought it was cool. I called my dad, who's a businessman. I said, I think I'm going to start a t-shirt company. And he kind of laughed and said, <laughs> send you to grad school to make t-shirts, which <laughs> only motivated me more to make more t-shirts. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I made, I made a couple of like really cool, comfortable hoodies. And on the, the bottom of the hood, it said, move upside down to get me to sort of motivate. And I, I met a woman who thought like, it was very cool. Where'd you get that hoodie? Needless to say, she ended up becoming the investor to the idea. And since then, I moved to San Francisco to grow this company and started a whole line of clothing, like really, really simple, classic, active wear, athleisure. I mean, it's great to travel in. And I have curated, I've carefully chosen every single word that goes on the clothing. The inside of every product has a manifesto I wrote uh, about wow. Uh, mind and body focus and how we are unbreakable at our core. It's a super inspiring, I think it's inspiring manifesto. And um, we've had a lot of, a lot of people say, you know what, even though I'm not walking around all day long looking at the word, there's something about when I put that on, it's, it's almost like a uniform of mindfulness to get me to dial yeah. in. And there's also, by the way, a lot of sports psychology research that says if, if you bring your brain to focus on one word versus a sentence cue, the simplification in your mind will actually make you remember and take on the energy of that word. There's, there's a, a bunch of research that also says, look at a positive word, you'll have a more positive feeling. So that was, that was the concept behind the company. And then we ended up taking that philosophy to people who really, really needed those reminders um, and thus began the Blanket Project. And can you tell us more about the Blanket Project? Yeah, um, it's probably my most uh, impassioned mission. Um, I will spend my life doing this. So when I started seeing, okay, it was helping, it was helping athletes in high pressure moments. And then it became people who wanted to, you know, lose weight. And then it became people who were going through tough times and they just needed to focus on gratitude. Um, I saw that the philosophy had some real um, weight to it. And I had a couple people in my life, very close people in my life who were diagnosed with cancer. Um, one person in particular who, who died from pancreatic cancer and thought to myself, you know, until we find that cure, which I think it's going to take some time, why not bring these messages of optimism and emotional support and strength and courage and unbreakable spirit to people facing their darkest moments? And so I, I wrote this manifesto, um, put it on a blanket, and originally started selling these blankets on my website and got a lot of response, and then ended up partnering with different organizations to donate these blankets to people in getting chemotherapy, um, you know, people who are going to be going to the hospital for surgery. A lot of family members were finding comfort in the blankets. Um, I had an amazing life-changing experience where a woman was so moved by it that she made a very significant donation of 2,500 of these blankets to Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital. And I can go on and on, but, but since then we have, we have wrapped thousands of cancer patients in the blanket and also work with some mental health organizations to help people like, you know, it's pretty common today to, to face some kind of a anxiety or depression struggle. Um, it's a, a big chunk of our population is struggling. I, especially right now, I would say everybody is struggling. And so we, we kind of all need these reminders, but maybe we need them extra badly at certain moments in our life. Yes. I feel like the world can use your blankets, one big blanket right now. <laughs> we, we, our world could definitely use to be wrapped with 
warmth and love and courage and resilience for sure. Yes. So I have a question for you about the one word. Um, is there, do you have a constant one word that resonates with you or do you change that one word every day for you to, depending on what you need that day? I love that question. Um, I love that question, A, because I'm a word person. It's the whole premise, I think, of my, it's the whole, whole premise of my brand. But I think it's also the whole basis of, of what I do in my coaching and my therapy is we become the words that we think. We become the words that we speak to ourselves and our own crazy minds. We become the words we speak to others because it's going to come right back at us. We become the words that we listen to, the words that we read. Um, so I really appreciate the question. And interestingly, when I started this whole writing of the word on a, an athlete's clothing, I started thinking, well, what if I, what if I sent uh, messages, text messages to some, some clients and said, this is the word of the day. I had sort of a word of the day. Yeah. Just focus on the, this one word. And yeah, your day will get busy, but rain yes. it back in. And they would range. The words would range a lot. So depending on the kind of energy that they needed, you know, some, some clients I'd send, I'd send the word smile because I knew that if they just remembered to smile, you know, maybe it wasn't joy that brought the smile. Maybe it was the smile that brought the joy. Um, and I could, I could talk your ear off about every word I've ever sent. But if, if you asked me to give you my go-to word, um, and it is on our clothing, we have done incredibly well selling it. It's just, I think it's a more sophisticated word in our line is the word evolve. And the reason I love that word is that to me, it represents, you know, forward movement, a better version of oneself. And, and it honors the fact that these kinds of changes happen gradually. It is a slow, gradual change. We do not change overnight. And I think in the field I'm in and what I see in our society, there's so much pressure to, to, to change quickly. We want immediate gratification. We want to get out of pain right away. We want to microwave ourselves yes. to success and, and mental health. And it doesn't work that way. It's an evolution and it's slow and it ebbs and it flows. And if we were to think in terms of tiny, tiny, tiny increments, yes. 1% compounding impact over time, even if, even if you have a, a day where you fall off the wagon, get back on, <laughs> you know? 1% over time creates that sort of evolved, wiser, stronger version. So I love that word. Um, when, I, when I launched that word, my business partner was like, you are, n nobody's ever going to walk around wearing an evolved shirt. And we made a bet. And I said, you, I will bet you. <laughs> and of course, I went and contacted every single family and family member and friends. And you got to buy one of these shirts. But it's <laughs> really well. And it's created a great conversation. Like, what does it mean to evolve? What does it mean? That's fantastic. I love it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your word. So in this time of evolving and change, what advice do you have for people around being resilient? What does it mean to be resilient? So, oh my God, I want an hour on just this. <laughs> we can have a follow-up conversation. So, this doesn't have to be the only time that we're speaking on this show. Relatively <laughs> swiftly, but I think that that's a great question. Um, I think that the scope of what's happening right now and the fact that this, this pandemic and the situation is hitting us from every angle with, with uncertainty in almost every direction is, is, is poking holes at all of the typical coping strategies that a human has to deal with stress. Um, I'm seeing universally, we are all kind of brought to our psychological knees around these coping mechanisms, they're not solving that fear because the fear is so big and the fear is living with us on lockdown. It has moved into our bedrooms with us and we can't even escape it. So when, when you start talking to people about the fear and you get them to stop avoiding and running away from it and trying to solve it um, and push it away or scroll, scroll it away. <laughs> you'll, start, you'll start learning from people that at the base and the base of the base of the fear is a discomfort, that they want to avoid discomfort because whether it's fear of losing their money, fear of getting sick 
and dying, fear of a loved one dying, fear of loss of identity, all of these losses will produce a lot of discomfort. And I think that the more I get people to look at the fear, name the fear, talk about the fear, don't run away, but look, stare at it in the eye, invite it to the dinner table with you instead of shoving food down your throat to avoid it. And really ask yourself, is the discomfort permanent? Because you'll discover no, discomfort is not. It, it rises, it's fall, it falls, it's not static, it's actually temporary. And yes, it, is, it can be brutal, but yes. we, we have already survived many moments of discomfort. Some people have survived very intense discomforts. We are a species that knows how to endure these impermanent waves of discomfort. And so I would say resilience comes from embracing the fear, riding the waves of discomfort, and getting on the other side of the wave to realize, wow, I've actually grown from that. I'm, I'm stronger because of it. In fact, I kind of have a, a, an infinite power um, and, and a capability to endure things that I didn't think I could before. And if you talk to any Holocaust survivor, any um, cancer survivor, anyone who's lost a loved one, they will probably tell you that while it was painful, that they are better off for it and they are stronger from it and they are, they are more resilient creatures. They didn't break, they grew. And to bring it to sports, you know, a, a muscle can yes. only grow if it is extremely stressed. Sometimes you even purposely tear a muscle. You, you, you rip it, you tear it, you stress it, and then you rest it and it grows. Same with, with our courage and optimism and um, emotional strength. It gets tested. Yes. It's, it's put under extreme stress. Then we come out the other side and we're stronger for it. So that would be my resilience story. That's such a great analogy, what you just shared with the, with the muscles and never really thought of it that way. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, a couple of things before we wrap up. What is at least one takeaway that you would like our audience to remember about our conversation today? You are your own greatest coach. You and your body and your intuitions are already genius. You just need to pay attention to them. Um, the whole premise of my company and my practice is to look within for, for the answers. Um, I would say, I'm a huge believer in, in reflection and introspection. Take time every day or week of your life to just pause and ask yourself, like, what did you notice? What are you feeling? What are you thinking? Be, be a curious seeker of truth within yourself. And I, I, have, um, I have a code that I send a lot to clients. They know this. Is, it's called the G2 code. G2 code. I literally just sent G2, and it means no matter what you're going through, no matter how brutal the moment is, no matter how much you feel like you just want to bolt from your life or you can't be present with what you're feeling, just remember to practice growth and gratitude. How, are you, how can you grow from this moment? And how can you practice gratitude? Even, even when life is really dark, you can find things that you're grateful for. And for some people, it's literally taking them outdoors and, and finding gratitude for the color of the sky um, or the feeling of the water, you know, that, that, that drips on their body in a shower and that's the one thing that feels pure. It sometimes is a super simple sensory thing. Sometimes it's a relationship. Sometimes it's someone from the past, but growth and gratitude. How can I grow? And what am I grateful for? Those are some great vaccines to struggle. Thank you for sharing your G2 code because I am grateful for you and our conversation today. So Lee, how can people find you? Because I do want them to find you. I want them to find me too. Um, you can find me on my website, which is getyourmindinmotion.com. Getyourmindinmotion.com. And our Instagram handle is at yourmindinmotion. And I would welcome any interaction. We are always looking for engagement. 
feedback, thoughts, words, ideas. Um, and you can also get me on Facebook at uh, Get Your Mind in Motion. Great. So I'm going to repeat that. So on the web, getyourmindinmotion.com, Instagram at Your Mind in Motion, and Facebook at Get Your Mind in Motion. Yes. So with that, thank you so much, Lee, for sharing your, your story, your insights, and being such an inspiration to us all. Thank you for listening. Thank you for asking. You're quite welcome. Our pleasure. See you next time on Rest. <laughs>